thanks, uh, uh, Pauline and uh, uh, and uh, Craig for introducing me. Um, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the book in in a moment. Uh, the title, as they both said, uh, is Belfast Violence and Border Troubles: The Birth of Northern Ireland, 1920 to 1922. Uh, in my introduction, I'd just like to uh, say a few things. Uh, the first thing is that uh, uh, the two years of community conflict, uh, which plagued the north of Ireland's earliest uh, phase between the spring of 1920 and the autumn of 1922, actually coincided with an unprecedented spell of constitutional and political change. Uh, arguably, the violence which broke out in the north, and particularly in its uh, leading city in, 19, in the summer of 1920, was not coincidental. And indeed, uh, the relationship between communal disturbances uh, and ongoing political tension were irrevocably uh, intertwined. Uh, this is the theme of my uh, recent book, A Difficult Birth, Northern Ireland's Early Years, 1920 to 25, uh, which is published by Eastwood Books Dublin. Um, and the correlation, in fact, between the pending uh, political or constitutional change uh, and a corresponding rise in communal violence had already been experienced uh, several times during the course of the 19th century. Uh, especially during William Gladstone's Home Rule legislation in 1886, uh, when disturbances in Belfast uh, claimed the lives of over 50 people uh, and also led to, to several hundred injuries. And of course, they would be the catalyst uh, for um, uh, serious outbreaks of violence during the more prolonged uh, modern conflict in uh, Northern Ireland, between 1969 and 1998. Um, the um, first part of my talk uh, will um, uh, provide a, a very brief outline of the major political events um, uh, and diplomatic events of, the, uh, of this short uh, but vital two-year uh, period um, in, in the region's history. The second part of the talk will trace the origins of violence in Belfast, uh, where most of this area's violence uh, took place. In fact, I'd just like to make that contrast um, between uh, the central or pivotal position of Belfast in as far as the violence was concerned between 1920 and 1922, and the more modern conflict um, when other parts of the, of the province uh, of Northern Ireland were uh, seriously affected, uh, more seriously affected by, by the violence, uh, particularly the border areas and also places like Derry, uh, London area as well. Um, so um, so part, part one, uh, part two, we'll look at that violence in Belfast. Um, and then the final part of the talk, uh, border trouble, will describe the rather different nature of the security incidents which took place in rural areas uh, and will describe IRA incursions into Northern Territory, as well as look at attacks by the security force members, mainly members of the uh, Ulster Special Constabulary, the USC, which was formed, in fact, at the end of 1920, in places like County Derry, Tyrone, Fermanagh, and the small village of Cushendall in County Antrim. The first section is what I call political change and community conflict. Uh, and the island of Ireland had, of course, been in uh, political turmoil for nearly a, decade, uh, nearly a decade before the outbreak of sectarian disturbances in its north uh, in 1920. The island, in fact, and I've written about this in another book, had been on the cusp of civil war in 1914 when Sir Edward Carson's newly armed Ulster volunteers appeared to be heading towards a confrontation uh, with either the British Army or John Redmond's uh, national volunteers. Conflict was only avoided on the island by the start of international war. And later on, the seismic events in Dublin during uh, Easter 1916 
uh, and the subsequent political rise of Sinn Féin uh, between uh, 1917 and 1919 meant that Ireland's political landscape uh, was fundamentally different uh, in 1919, 1920 uh, than the one which had been in place less than a decade before. The British Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, uh, influenced as he was by the creation of new nation states at Versailles in 1919, uh, was convinced that political compromise was the only solution to Ireland's problems. And this was the premise behind his Better Government of Ireland legislation, his bill, uh, which was introduced at Westminster early in 1920. Uh, Lloyd George, and I, I might be uh, being a little wee bit cynical here, uh, but perhaps in the same vein as uh, Tony Blair much later uh, in the late 1990s, was perhaps um, thinking of his own political legacy when he proposed the creation of devolved legislatures in Dublin and Belfast. The Northern one, uh, which like its um, uh, parental model in London, uh, took the form of a bicameral legislature with the uh, proposed Northern Ireland House of Commons electing 52 members of parliament, uh, initially at least under a new system, a new voting system of proportional representation, the first ever used in, uh, in Britain. The bill's long passage, about 10 months, through Westminster was a fractious one, uh, with both loyalists, uh, unionists and nationalists far from certain about the benefits of a new parliament of their own. For the latter, the nationalists, the partition bill, as they dismissed the proposed legislation, was in a sense a double whammy as it meant they would be cut off from their co-relationists in the rest of Ireland, and also because they would be vulnerable uh, in what was likely to be, and was, of course, uh, a unionist-dominated parliament uh, in uh, Belfast. Unionists, on the other hand, were concerned by the loss of three Ulster counties, uh, Donegal, Cavan and Monaghan, and they were bemused at being asked to back what they initially perceived to be another version of the Home Rule legislation, which, of course, they had so fiercely opposed in the pre-war period. Unionism's new leader, Sir James Craig, along with invaluable support from Belfast's unionist press, successfully managed to persuade uh, unionists that their best interests would be served by this bill, in which they would crucially have control over internal security, Uh, as well as having responsibility for other key areas, such as health, education, trade, and and so on. Westminster, on the other hand, retained responsibility for national defence, including uh, also income tax uh, collection, foreign policy, uh, um, and so on, whilst a new parliament in Belfast was to elect its uh, new government and also uh, a cabinet. The bill became law just before Christmas 1920, and elections to the new parliament were announced to take place on Empire Day, the 24th of March, 1920, uh, 24th of May, 1921. This long uh, electoral contest proved to be one of the most bitterly fought in the whole history of Northern Ireland. The Unionist Party under Craig's leadership fought a campaign Uh, under the simple slogan, do your duty. Craig's party, uh, and perhaps we can have the first uh, slide, Craig, um, of James Craig. Uh, Do your duty was the slogan. His party, the Unionist Party, received unanimous backing from the Loyalist press with the Belfast Telegraph, which was then a very uh, uh, traditionalist right-wing newspaper, telling us readers that the contest represented the chance to choose between, and I quote, loyalty or disloyalty, and a republic or a British empire. James Craig realised from the start that unionist unity uh, was essential if his party was to triumph at the polls. In a key election address, he appealed to voters, do your duty, let no one stand aside. The cause is sacred and worthy of every personal sacrifice 
Rally round me so that I may shatter your enemies and their hopes of a Republican flag. The eyes of our friends throughout the empire are upon us. Let them see that we are determined, as they, to uphold the cause of loyalty. And perhaps uh, we can have the next slide. Despite a shared opposition to both partition and the parliament in Belfast, uh, Joe Devlin's United Irish League Party, the UIL, and Sinn Féin both contested this election. Several of Sinn Féin's big names stood for seats in northern constituencies, including Eamon de Valera uh, in County Down, Michael Collins in uh, County Armagh, and Arthur Griffiths, uh, Griffith, who was actually contesting for Manor and South Tyrone. Collins was reported to have addressed an open air meeting in Armagh, probably in Irish Street, and de Valera, under the watchful eye of RIC personnel, told the County Down audience to cast your vote for nothing else than the legitimation of the Republic for Ireland against empire, for freedom against slavery, for right and justice against, uh, against force and wrong, here and everywhere. UIL, which ended up fielding uh, 13 candidates, as against uh, Sinn Féin's uh, larger number of 20, called its manifesto national suicide. And this charismatic leader we see here, Joe Devlin, who was to successfully uh, stand in both, uh, in two constituencies, in both West Belfast and County Antrim, uh, lambasted partition, which he described as an English dodge. Speaking at a large gathering in uh, Ballycastle uh, on the um, Northampton coast, Devlin told his supporters, uh, quote, Providence has fashioned this land to be one and indivisible. Ireland is one, not by directive of England, but fashioned out as one race with a single purpose and an inspiring ideal. And we are going to make an earnest, a powerful and a triumphant fight against this sacrilege upon our nation. The threat of renewed and sustained violence provoked by several weeks of bitter electioneering was a very real one. But this heavy security presence um, afforded by the British Army and the RIC stopped this from occurring. This is not to suggest that there was an absence of violence or intimidation, and I will refer later to some trouble in um, uh, in County Tyrone and near Cookstown. The worst security incident of, uh, in Belfast um, occurred at a unionist rally at the Oval Football Ground, a home of Glen Torn team in East Belfast, where James Craig address, addressed a large crowd of followers. A young loyalist was shot, fatally wounded, during a feeder parade in the west of the city. Uh, and a Catholic uh, former soldier uh, was also uh, shot dead in a retaliatory shooting close to the short strand uh, after the meeting had ended. Allegations of intimidation and physical attack on both candidates and voters were also recorded. A meeting involving three Labour candidates at the Ulster Hall in, um, in Belfast uh, was hijacked by a large uh, loyalist crowd returning from their work in the shipyard. And a number of allegations of voter intimidation were made on election day itself. However, the senior British civil servant and Irish assistant undersecretary, Sir Ernest uh, Clark, discounted the charge that such attacks had been widespread. Yet election fever was undeniably real, and over 90% of eligible electors were reported to have cast their vote in several constituencies. Although the Unionist Party was widely tipped to be triumphant at the polls, the scale of its victory was a surprise really to all. All 40 Unionist Party candidates were successful, and with the small contingent of nationalists and Republicans, uh, that was six representatives each, uh, refusing to take their seats in the new parliament, this was in practice an all Unionist body. The consequences of this would be profound and, I, I would argue, uh, long-lasting. The new Belfast Parliament from the beginning lacked an effective opposition and the cut-and-thrust atmosphere 
of most parliamentary chambers. From the start, Catholics felt alienated from the democratic process and unionists were reluctant to make political compromise on account of what they perceived to be their own precarious position. Uh, next slide, uh, Craig, please. Within a few weeks uh, of the election, the new parliament was formally opened by King George V at Belfast uh, City Hall uh, on the 22nd of June, 1921. Uh, that's seen inside uh, the chamber of the City Hall on that day in 1921, which is the um, uh, front jacket of my, uh, the, my book, which was published just under a year ago. The King's advisors had been warned over the security issues uh, posed by such a trip. And in the end, uh, George V's visit, along with, of course, that of uh, his wife, uh, Queen Mary, uh, lasted barely six hours. At the centre of his trip was the formal opening, as we can see here, uh, of the new Northern Ireland Parliament. At this ceremony, the monarch delivered a stirring plea for peace and reconciliation across the whole of Ireland. So it was addressed not just at the Northern representatives, uh, but at Sinn Féin and, and uh, the, the wider Irish electorate. King George passionately told the assembled representatives, and I quote from part of a very famous uh, speech, I speak from a full heart when I say that my coming to Ireland today may prove to be the first step towards the beginning of the end of strife among her people, whatever their race or creed. In that hope, I appeal to all Irishmen to pause, to stretch out the hand of forbearance and conciliation, to forgive and to join in making for the land they love a new era of peace, contentment and goodwill. Perhaps we can have the next slide, please. Barely 48 hours after the pageantry and celebration in Belfast has subsided, the IRA exhibited its unambiguous response to the King's pleas. During the morning of the 24th of June, a military train dispatching the officers, men and horses of the Royal Bazaars, returning to their Dublin headquarters after their Royal Protection duties, was attacked by, the, by an IRA bomb squad led by Frank Aiken close to Bestbrook and the newly created border. Six people and uh, over 80 horses, including many of those that had been employed in Wednesday's ceremonial occasion in Belfast, were killed when a remotely controlled device destroyed the last carriage of the troop train. This attack and the subsequent high level of Republican activity in Belfast, as well as the apparent freedom of movement enjoyed by the Ulster Protestant Association, the UPA, meant that tension would remain high in the, across the respective communities. Thoughts of peace and conciliation, which were raised by the King, would soon be replaced by the more familiar and darker ones of fear and suspicion. The result was that, despite the announcement of a truce by Republicans two weeks later, even more costly life, loss of life would happen in the newly born state during the second half of 1921 and particularly in the first half of 1922. Although only the Imperial Parliament at Westminster had the power uh, to bring about political and constitutional change in the North, the role of the fledgling administration in the Irish uh, Free State in indirectly influencing and arguably exacerbating uh, the tinderbox situation within the North should not be minimalized. The clear failure of the IRA, uh, of IRA's uh, Northern divisions to observe the organization's declared truce early in July 1921, and the IRA's frequent physical incursions into Northern territory, coupled with the group's paramilitary operations in the North, uh, are discussed later in this talk. Sinn Féin also implemented uh, a boycott of Northern goods across the rest of Ireland as a response to the intimidation of Northern Catholics uh, in their Belfast workplaces. This resulted in the destruction and frequent, um, uh, frequent turning back of Northern 
merchandise, uh, which was being transported into IFS, Irish Free State Territory, by uh, road, train and waterway. It also involved uh, what I was arguing in my book, uh, a slightly less successful boycotting of Ulster-based banks and currency. And although it did not produce the economic impact envisaged by its architects, the boycott did little to foster any uh, unionist, positive unionist feelings uh, that they had friendly southern neighbours. Although loyalists would regard these southern neighbours with suspicion and anger, it would be political and military events in the rest of Ireland, which ironically would help their own prospects within the north. The treaty signed by David Lloyd George and Michael Collins, or what Collins described as signing his own personal death warrant, uh, in London before Christmas 1921, this would lead to a massive schism within the Republican movement, which ultimately led uh, to a civil war, as we know, in the Irish Free State the following summer, summer of 1922 onwards. This internecine war, uh, this internecine conflict, turned out to be even bloodier than the Anglo-Irish War, and meant that it was not feasible for the IRA to sustain its operations in Northern Ireland particularly given the successes which James Craig's administration had during the second half of 1922 in terms of countering the IRA within its own territory. And I come back to the Special Powers uh, Act and internment later. The next section is the Belfast violence. Uh, there were several contributory factors to the violence which broke out in Belfast during the summer of 1920. The Anglo-Irish War, as I said, had been raging for a year or more, and reports of attacks on police personnel in the south and the west and the centre of Ireland, of, of the island, were printed in northern newspapers uh, on a daily basis. Indeed, with an All-Ireland Peace Force at the time, the RIC, the Royal Irish Force uh, Constabulary, in frontline action uh, against the IRA and its officers deployed right across the island, uh, it was probably inevitable that there would be several northern police casualties, uh, and there were. The shootings of two senior Ulster-born RIC officers, uh, Colonel Gerard Smith in Cork and Oswald Swansea in Lisburn, in Michael Collins' authorised offer operations. These shootings led to backlashes against Catholics in predominantly Protestant towns. Smith was especially vocal in his denunciation of Sinn Féin and the IRA, and he was shot in the Cork Country Club uh, in the summer of 1920, and uh, in July 1920. Um, and um, when uh, uh, the Southern Rail crew refused to carry uh, his coffin back to his hometown of Ban Bridge in, in County Down, uh, sectarian disturbances broke out in, uh, in, in a mainly unionist town. And a similar pattern of events, as I suggested before, happened the following month in August uh, 1920, when Oswald Swansea was shot leaving a church service in the County Antrim town. It was in Christchurch Cathedral, uh, Anglican Cathedral in the town centre, still there today, of course. The spring and early summer of 1920 had also witnessed the large scale outburst of violence. Uh, in, in Derry, uh, stroke Londonderry, which had recently elected its first Catholic mayor. These troubles in the maiden city had involved the British Army, the IRA and the UVF, which had uh, recently reorganised in the area. And well over 20 people uh, lost their lives uh, in May and June 1920. It was just before the troubles broke out in, in, in uh, Belfast. Another cause of the 20s conflict was the heightening political tension caused by the better government of Ireland legislation, which I uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, the bill was making its way through the Westminster Parliament, of course. The Unionist Party's veteran leader, Sir Edward Carson, racked the tension up an arch or two further by delivering a virulent speech at the main 12th of July demonstration just outside Belfast, when he urged his supporters not to tolerate Sinn Féin. And at the same time, he issued a stark warning to Lloyd George and his colleagues, and I quote, if having offered you help, you are yourselves unable to protect us from the machinations of Sinn Féin, and you won't take over 
uh, you won't take our help, then we will tell you that we will take the matter into our own, our own hands. We will reorganize. Within days of uh, Carson's strident Orange Day warning and the shooting of Colonel Smith in Cork, a large crowd of Loyalist shipyard workers forced Catholics uh, and a smaller number of social workers uh, to leave their work positions at Harlem and Wolf's massive shipyard in the east of the city. Many men were beaten with what was uh, euphemistically labelled shipyard confetti, uh, iron nuts, rivets, bolts and the like. And they had to swim for their lives across the Musgrave Channel uh, to safety. That evening, uh, perhaps we can have the next uh, slide, please. That evening, trams taking the Loyalist shipyard workers back to their homes, mainly in the west and the north of the city, were stoned by Catholic crowds as they passed the National Short Strand area. Later that evening, a young woman, uh, Margaret Node, was the first victim of around 500 in Belfast alone uh, when she was fatally wounded in the Cromwell Square district to the south of Belfast Centre. Later that evening, uh, there was exchange of gunfire in the west of the city, and the following day, uh, thousands more Catholics were intimidated from both their workplaces and homes. The patterns of violence, which would play, plague the city uh, for over two years, emerged within the first two or three days of the, of the disturbances, and indeed bore striking similarities uh, to the uh, riots which broke out in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Sectarian name calling as well as stone and bottle throwing often conducted at flashpoints like Millfield, the Short Strand, and here as we see in this slide in York Street to the north of the city centre, were usually followed by the intervention of security forces. And later during the hours of darkness, the crack of gunfire from both nationalist and unionist quarters. High velocity rifles, and this is a, a big difference, of course, to the last serious bite of disturbances uh, 35 years before. Uh, high, the high velocity rifles, which could target potential victims from distances of several hundred yards, even machine guns would be used intermittently during fierce gun battles. Hand grenade explosives, mill bombs, were thrown at tram cars and at children playing in the streets and were also used to start fires at commercial premises, schools and cinemas. In general, it was Catholics who had to endure the double trauma of eviction from both work and home. Many of the most serious incidents had, as in the modern conflict, a tit-for-tat element, such as the killing of suspected Republicans or ordinary Catholics, often after the recent shooting of police officers or unionist politicians, either by loyalist gunmen or by men in uniform. I'll return to this, these aspects of the violence in a moment. The next section is to look at the protagonists. Uh, first of all, the Northern IRA. Uh, some writers have downplayed the IRA's role in the 1920s violence, suggesting that it took merely a defensive uh, role or, um, uh, on, on, the, on the side of the wider Catholic population. However, we think this is a little bit simplistic. Uh, although the Third Northern Division was on the back foot, especially uh, early in the conflict, like it was in the modern conflict for that matter, um, it, it did experience um, major organisation difficulties in that period. But the overall part, role, a part played by the Northern IRA in provoking quite often spontaneous responses of loyalists to these initial assaults was a highly significant one. The 3rd Northern Division, which operated predominantly in the greater Belfast area, organised uh, numerous attacks on police personnel in both city and countryside, and it was also engaged uh, in attacking Protestant civilians, uh, both in their homes and on their journeys to and from work. Indeed, the rationale behind the staging of such incidents, which often provoked, as I said, revenge attacks by corrupt police officers uh, and unionist gunmen or bombers, appears to have been distinctly counterproductive. And such desperation on the part of the Northern Republican leadership 
unquestionably led to increased levels of danger for the wider Catholic community. Initially, the membership of the IRA in Belfast was quite low, uh, probably uh, under a thousand volunteers. And it was only after internal restructuring in the spring of 1921, as well as the practical repercussions of the signing of the truce a few weeks later, that the Republican campaign in the North, orchestrated by uh, leaders like Joe McKelvey and uh, later on Seamus Woods, actually uh, gained uh, any real momentum. The IRA's chief targets in Greater Belfast were men in uniform, uh, specifically the RIC. And for an 18 month period um, in 1921 to 22, uh, the USC. Another Republican tactic was to target tram cars, transporting Protestant workers to and from their employment in the shipyards. In two separate attacks within, 24, uh, within two days, within 48 hours, in November 1921, seven men lost their lives and many others were injured, severely injured, when Mills bombs were lobbed into their trams as they passed through central Belfast. A press report graphically described the carnage which greeted rescuers in the wake of the second attack. Their begrimed faces, that's the victims, begrimed faces, soiled and oily from their day's work, were smattered with blood which was flowing from their wounds. Their dungarees were also saturated with blood and with their clothing torn in places by the force of the explosion and the fragments of the bomb. The IRA also targeted commercial premises in the city, particularly during a frenetic three-month period in the middle of 1922. Uh, nearly 20 uh, commercial premises were attacked in the course of two days in the middle of May. And in the most concentrated spate of attacks uh, on the um, 26th of May, there were as many as 13 fires started during the course of that evening. The Belfast Telegraph castigated what they described as these falls fire bugs, maintaining that such attacks formed part of the criminal conspiracy, which is going to make the government of Northern Ireland impossible and to make life intolerable. One of those uh, arson attacks that may actually have a personal impact. It, 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 it contained, uh, thank you, the, it curtailed the uh, school uh, career of my uh, father, John, who lived at the time in the Grosvenor Road area of West Belfast. And he attended, this is the remains of it, the model school, uh, which was then situated in Divis Street. He had been aware that evening that his school had probably been attacked. Um, smoke was billowing from a building close to the great spires of St. Patrick's Catholic Church. But his parents refused to allow him to explore. And it was only the next morning as he made his way to school and saw what we see in the picture here, it's charred remains, that he fully realized what had happened. He recalled many years later, police were guarding the building but there was some jeering when the Divis Street boys spotted us. I wasn't that surprised because there had been two previous fires at the school and we had been stoned on our way there a few times. This has happened just a few weeks before the end of my last term there. And with the new school's premises located on the Cliftonville Road in North Belfast, where I believe they still are, my father agreed to let me start work. As noted already, Protestants were prone to sectarian attack on their journeys to work and also from time to time in their actual workplace. The most grisly sectarian attacks by the IRA occurred in a cooperage where they were making wheels in Little Patrick Street on the 19th of May uh, 1922, when a nine-strong IRA squad burst in, demanding workers to declare uh, their religious persuasion. Shots were then directed into the smaller group of Protestants who had stood to one side, and four of them were wounded, three fatally. Even the powerful and influential were not uh, safe from Republican uh, paramilitaries. As in a later modern conflict, uh, IRA assassination teams targeted Unionist representatives, particularly those who had been outspoken critics 
uh, of the of, of Sinn Féin and the IRA. Uh, Michael Collins was uh, believed to have uh, authorised the cleaner of a distinguished great war general and unionist Westminster MP, uh, Sir Henry Wilson, in London's fashionable Belgravia district in June 1922. And a few weeks before this, an MP in the new Belfast Parliament, William Tweddell, uh, he was shot as he walked to his draper shop in North Street in the city centre. In the new Parliament, Sir James Craig insisted that if those who committed this dastardly outrage thought it would be for a moment weaken the functions of this parliament or the steadfast courage of the people of Ulster, they never made a greater error. I'd like to look now um, in, in two stages, really, at violence coming directed at Catholics, which was the majority of the violence uh, in these two years, uh, mainly from uh, loyalist uh, assassins. As would be the case in the modern conflict, uh, there was no one unified loyalist paramilitary movement. Although the UVF had performed this function, uh, flexing if not actually using its paramilitary muscle in the pre-war period, many of its largely disciplined men would join the ranks of the newly formed Ulster Special Constabulary in late 1920 and early 1921. However, there was still a considerable number of ill-disciplined loyalists who were prepared to join the ranks of the new, newly formed Belfast Protestant Association, the BPA, which soon merged with the larger Ulster Protestant Association, the UPA, uh, um, uh, or else it came in the um, act in the capacity of freelance assassins, if I can use that term, uh, of Catholics, especially on Belfast streets. As I said earlier, over 60% of all conflict uh, fatalities in the New Orphan Ireland, as over 350, were Catholic civilians, who as a group barely thought, formed uh, a third of its population. In other words, uh, Catholics were twice as likely to be killed or seriously injured in sectarian violence as were members of the Norse majority community. Loyalist groups had, of course, access to most of the huge arsenal of weaponry which had been smuggled into or onto the Antrim and Dine coasts uh, in the spring of 1914. Despite the fragmented nature of loyalist paramilitary groupings, uh, such as the Imperial Guards, the Cromwell Clubs, and even the ranks of the UPA itself, it is highly likely that senior leaders in the paramilitary groups would have uh, had to authorise specific shooting uh, and bombing attacks, even if the subjects of these outrages were often randomly chosen at short notice, quite often, as I've hinted, uh, as a response to recent IRA attacks, carried out by impassioned on-the-ground assassins. A police file, which is still available on UPA activity, which I've referred to in my writing, in East Belfast, described the organisation as having, I quote, attracted to itself a large number of the lowest and least desirable of the hooligan element, and suggested that the group's objective was simply, I quote, the extermination of Catholics by any and every means. The most striking feature of UPA activity was the raw sectarianism, which exhibited itself in some of the actions of its gunmen and bombers. These were believed to have included men like Big Davy Duncan, a former uh, Irish guardsman uh, who was reputed to dress up in a pinstripe suit and wearing his distinctive cravat and uh, trilby hat uh, and far around street corners uh, into Catholic districts. Uh, Robert Simpson, the chairman of the UPA and leading East Belfast um, activist who would later be interned, and most notably of all, of course, uh, some of you may have heard of him, Buck Alec Robinson. Robinson, still a teenager at the time these troubles broke out, was believed by the authorities to have been involved in several shooting and bombing attacks on Catholics. Later in his life, Robinson accrued a reputation for being a local character, a local hard man, who had once been a bodyguard to Al Capone, and on his return to Belfast, 
he could be spotted walking his pet lions that he had um, purchased from Dublin Zoo down York Street. There are too many horrific attacks involving UPA personnel to consider at length in this talk. But they did include the shooting of two Catholics on the North Belfast tram for the simple crime, if you want to call it that, of crossing themselves on a vehicle which had passed the Catholic Church. The throwing into the River Ligon of a young Catholic barman by a group of unionists near his short strand home. Um, he couldn't swim and sadly uh, uh, slipped onto the water and drowned. And the setting on fire of a, a Protestant doctor's uh, housekeeper in Donegal Pass to the south of Belfast Centre. Uh, she was badly burned, but she survived. One of the most infamous uh, sectarian attacks in Belfast during this period took place in Weaver Street in the Catholic enclave of the Marrowbone in the north of the city in, in February 1922. Youngsters had been uh, taking part in traditional skipping games in the street when two intruders lobbed a bomb into the group of playing children. Six people, including four children, taking part in uh, these games uh, were actually killed in the blast and another dozen were seriously injured. Nearly 80 years later, I spoke to the cousin of one of the victims and she told me, my cousin Kitty, Kitty Kennedy, had just started working in a mill. She was 15, by the way. She lived in Weaver Street and one night she was skipping uh, in her street when a bomb was thrown in from North Derby Street. She and several children I had met were killed or seriously injured. Her father, John, was a big, fine, religious man, but despite his faith, he never got over the waste of such a young life. I'd like to look next at another group, um, uh, both the protagonists and victims, and it depends on, uh, obviously, uh, on circumstances, but they were, I would argue that they fell into both categories. The Ulster Special Constabulary, or the specials, Calls for the creation of a reserve police force to help hard-pressed regular officers and military personnel had grown in their intensity, particularly after the violence the rest of Ireland had spread to its northeast. And these calls, incidentally, weren't just from Ulster, from the north. They were from uh, England as well, from, uh, from particularly uh, on the advice of security forces. Although Lloyd George's cabinet had reservations about James Craig's request, for a reserve force to be created in order to relieve the pressure on the RIC and British Army. It was actually financial matters which persuaded them to finally accept a localised solution to the North's security needs. The Ulster Special Constabulary, the USC, was formally established at the start of November 1920. It was, uh, they were on the streets by the start of the new year. And it was proposed that the new force would be raised at county level and that would be split into three sections, each of them armed. Uh, next slide, please. The A specials were a uniformed, and we see them here, uh, paid full time force with around 2,000 officers, whilst the volunteer force of part time constables, and the most controversial group, the B division, were expected to carry out one night a week duty in their local areas. The less controversial C section uh, was permitted to use firearms whilst in duty, but they had no official uniform and they were designed purely as an emergency uh, reserve force consisting in general of older men. Although advertisements uh, for the new force were actually carried and printed in both unionist and nationalist newspapers, it was unionist organs like the Northern Whig which exhorted its readers to offer their services to the new force. An editorial in the Whig newspaper maintained, prudence and patriotism alike dictate that every Ulsterman capable of bearing arms should enrol in this special constabulary. Unless steps are taken to stamp out murder and sedition, we shall be compelled to go through the most terrible chapter in our checkered history. 
Now, for many Northern Catholics, the USC is regarded as Ulster's historical equivalent of the Black and Tans, another police force with a mixed reputation. Although I would argue there's a considerable amount of truth in this, uh, the comparison is not a wholly accurate one. And indeed, the USC made a positive contribution to the society they were serving by being largely responsible for restoring peace to the streets and the hillsides of Northern Ireland. However, the specials also had a fearsome reputation amongst the Catholic population at the time. Uh, future legendary journalist uh, Jimmy Kelly told me uh, the special that he encountered as a boy living on the Falls Road in West Belfast. He described them, and he wrote about this in his book as well, as swaggering lights who emerged from a local bar just before curfew hour, swinging their rifles and getting into a Lanthias, an armoured car, for a night of fun, shooting up the area and teaching, and I use the quote here, the Fenians a lesson. That despite their clear involvement uh, in a, um, a, a number of fatal shootings, and I'll look at one or two of these in a moment, the majority of complaints made against the specials involve relatively low-level acts of swearing, pushing, verbal abuse and the like. Many specials were, as I've mentioned, former members of the UVF, having served in France, and the majority of them sustained a disciplined and professional approach. But a sizable minority were most likely culpable of bringing a sectarian approach to their placing. The USC played no small part in suppressing Republican paramilitarism uh, from within their own borders and also from the IFS. And over 50 members of the Special Constabulary lost their lives in their endeavours to maintain peace on, on the front line. Um, um, at, at least um, six of these uh, lost their lives in the county for Manor, uh, including uh, Sir Wilfred Lucas uh, in one attack at Temple Barracks uh, and uh, Special Constable Thomas Dobson, uh, who was fatally a driver who was fatally wounded uh, in a pedicle attack, which I'll come to in, in, in a moment. I'd like to look now at what we call rogue cops or corrupt uh, police officers. And there's certainly evidence to suggest that several corrupt police officers participated in blatantly sectarian attacks on Catholics, mainly in the north and the west of Belfast. Most of these outrages were probably improvised and were usually retaliatory in their nature. However, this should not disguise the sheer brutality of these deeds. Local intelligence confirmed by Dublin's fledgling and uh, arguably, uh, arguably biased, of course, defence ministry, suggested that a series of attacks carried out against nationalists in Belfast including some men purported to have been active Republicans, have been orchestrated by RIC District Inspector John Nixon and RIC County Inspector Richard Harrison, along with a number of other lower-ranked officers, mostly based, incidentally, at the Brown Street Barracks in the Shankill Road area of West Belfast. Although these men, and they were very senior officers, vehemently denied any involvement in a number of shootings, including those of the Duffin brothers on the Falls Road, the fatal wounding of three Catholics in North Belfast. Uh, at least three of these, at least one of these, sorry, was believed to have been tortured before being shot. Uh, and the shooting of five men and boys in Arnon Street, also in North Belfast, uh, uh, as well as the murder of the McMahon family, which I'll come to in a second. Uh, evidence does strongly support the theory that uniformed assassins were implicated in these and possibly other outrages. Otherwise, it's hard to explain that the easy accessibility of gunmen to the troubled period, uh, troubled districts of the city, both on foot and by motor vehicle, particularly at a time when hardly anybody had motor cars, uh, during the period of curfew restriction. It was a reluctance to directly challenge Nixon's perceived impregnable position. Uh, local unionists were vociferous in their defence of him uh, and rallies were held uh, backing him. It was that protection uh, and that um, his, his perceived impregnable position uh, 
which deterred his superior officers and senior politicians like Dawson Bates, the Home Affairs Minister, and James Craig, the Prime Minister, from taking a tougher approach at an earlier stage. Uh, and it is revealing that disciplinary action uh, was only taken against Nixon uh, after Republican violence had ended. And even then, uh, it was on account of its so-called uh, political nature rather than his criminal activities. Probably the most notorious sectarian attack in Belfast during these troubles was uh, carried out by a probably carried out by a gang of corrupt police officers at the North Belfast home of Owen McMahon. He was a wealthy Catholic businessman uh, who, although a, a friend of Joe Devlin, had no known uh, political connections. And he lived uh, in affluence at a large property in Kinner Terrace, still uh, situated in the same spot off the Antrim Road. Following the shooting of two RIC men in Belfast a few hours earlier, we're talking about March uh, 1922, um, uniformed men used a sledgehammer to force their way into the McMahon home during the early hours of the 24th of March 1922 and rounded up the men and boys of the household. Apart from Mr McMahon and his six sons, his Donegal-born bar manager, Edward McKinney, a lodger uh, at old McMahon's house, were, were detained. Uh, incidentally, according to recently uh, released IRA records, uh, uh, this gentleman uh, was um, uh, claimed as an IRA volunteer. I still don't think that, that was the reason um, uh, for the attack on the home. Uh, if it had been uh, simply against um, the larger, it would have been carried out, presumably, uh, in, at the bar or wherever. Uh, but but it, is, it is important to point out his uh, Republican connections. Um, anyway, they were detained um, uh, in a downstairs room. Um, that this information, incidentally, uh, would have been held by the detective division in Belfast at the time. And, of course, its chief was, as I said, uh, Harrison. Anyway, they were ordered into the downstairs living room and the male members of the family were given a, a chilling warning. You boys say your prayers. Moments later, several volleys of gunfire rang out. As the assailants stole casually away into the night, alarmed neighbours uh, alerted the police and the ambulance service. And the scene which greeted um, them when they arrived at the scene a few minutes later was horrific. Uh, all the men uh, and the boys uh, in the um, room, with the exception of the youngest lad, uh, Michael, had been hit by bullets. And four of his brothers, plus Mr McKinney, were fatally wounded. The Irish Independent, next slide please. The Irish Independent suggested that the brutal slaughter of the McMahon family had been a deed surpassing anything that was done in Ireland during the reign of terror. Perhaps the most vivid account of the aftermath of this attack was given by the Belfast Telegraph, which described the scene in some horrific detail. The house smells of fresh blood. It seemed scarcely cold as it spread in large pools and small rivers all over the room. On either side of the fireplace lay large pools of blood, thick, heavy, coagulated stuff that turned one sick with horror. In places, it was uh, rubbed and disturbed as if someone had macerated fresh bullock's liver and strewn it all about. Uh, here, incidentally, we see a, a picture uh, of the funeral of um, several of the fatality uh, uh, the victims of the um, uh, shooting uh, outside Milltown Cemetery in West Belfast. It was one of the biggest uh, Catholic funerals in the city to that uh, at that point. Um, my penultimate section is uh, border trouble. Um, uh, there were several major security incidents along the newly created border, although the, most of the violence, as I said at the beginning, um, uh, 80, 85 percent at least uh, would have been in the capital. Uh, there was still some horrific violence elsewhere. Um, 
Uh, and this brought obviously anxiety and grief, uh, not only to those living in counties like Tyrone, Fermanagh, Down and others, but also led to increased tension within Belfast's back streets and led to trouble there. One daring, carefully planned IRA operation along the Fermanagh and Tyrone side of the border uh, on the 8th of February 1922 precipitated serious violence uh, in Belfast, culminating in close to 50 deaths in the city that month alone. In the hours of darkness, a large group of armed IRA personnel crossed the border and took over 40 Protestant hostages. These, uh, this is at Tyrone and Fermanagh. Uh, these included several USC and RIC officers, the son of a leading Fermanagh MP, unionist MP, and an elderly Tyrone, uh, I think it was Octa Cloy, landlord, who bemused his Republican captors with a non-stop tradition of biblical hymns, uh, psalms, uh, prayers, as well as several verses of the national anthem. Uh, I bet there were sorry that they... Uh, chose him afterwards. Um, but um, later in February, uh, another border incident further heightened sectarian attention across the province of Ulster. Over a dozen specials were ambushed by a large group of the IRA's 5th Northern Division uh, in the county Fermanagh, uh, sorry, the county of Monaghan town of Clunas, just a few miles from uh, uh, Enniskillen. The police officers had been travelling through IFS territory in order to catch a connecting train, which was destined for Enniskillen, which is where they were uh, uh, they were going for a training exercise, when they were ambushed at the town's railway station. In a fierce exchange, up to six people lost their lives, including four police officers and the IRA's leader in the area, Matt Fitzpatrick. Uh, next slide, please. Last slide, please. In addition... The IRA detained uh, four or five officers, only releasing them a couple of months later. And this RIC officer uh, is seen in the company of his family a couple of months after his uh, release from captivity. Many occupants of the trains, carriages, inclinus, as well as other passengers awaiting trains on the other platforms at the busy station, were forced to run or die for cover. One eyewitness described how shooting had broken out in his carriage uh, and moaned that a bullet had pierced his brand new hat. On a more serious note, he recalled hearing shots being discharged all over the train, mingling with the yells and screams of the men in other carriages. And he also poignantly heard one man appeal for mercy and another call for his mother. Many of the fatal shootings in the Ulster countryside involved members of the police service, particularly its new special constabulary, and well over 40 of its members lost their lives on attacks outside Belfast. Uh, the majority of the police, uh, USC, who lost their lives in the conflict, uh, unlike the overall figures, um, were actually uh, shot dead in, in, in rural areas. This often, or these often resulted in reprisal shootings by individual members of the police, including the shooting of four Catholics after IRA um, bombings, shootings and arson attacks in Desert Martin, County Derry, in, in, um, uh, in, um, uh, in, uh, in May 1922. There was also, to before I forget, there was also another attack uh, in May 1921, uh, during the campaign, the election campaign uh, outside Cooktown, uh, when the uh, USC uh, attacked two um, uh, farmers, two Catholic farmers, um, uh, uh, living in um, uh, in a, a deserted spot uh, outside a few miles from Cooktown, the Hayden brothers, and they fatally wounded one of them, Joseph. Uh, and there was a, a bit of an um, uh, inquiry into that, which, was, of course, was glossed over. But uh, it was um, uh, another attack on, on Catholics in, in, in that area. I want to look at uh, uh, two of the most controversial incidents to take place outside Northern Ireland's uh, capital, uh, and one affecting the Catholic population and one affecting the Protestant uh, population. 
Uh, the one uh, affecting the Catholic population took place outside, um, uh, in and outside the small village of Cushendal in County Antrim, on the, um, in the glands of Antrim. And the other occurred close to the County Down border uh, in farmlands outside uh, Newry. The first of these, that's at Cushendal, involved the USC and the British Army in three shootings, uh, which prompted critics uh, to uh, accuse the security forces of collusion, which, of course, was a frequent allegation in the more recent uh, conflict. Although most of County Antrim was loyalist in its political persuasion, Republican training exercise had been frequently reported uh, in the glens of Antrim. And on the evening of the 23rd of June 1922, a military detachment was ordered uh, and sent from uh, uh, Aldergrove in County Antrim, near where the airport is today, uh, to investigate a suspected IRA uh, training exercise in the hills and the fields above the village of Cushendall. <clears throat> Tension was already high across the north following the recent assassination in London uh, of Unionist MP and General uh, and, and Great War General, who I mentioned, Sir Henry Wilson. The military detachment met up with a group of USC officers, and the latter apprehended a young off-duty IRA volunteer, uh, who, uh, Seamus McAllister, who had been cycling on a road outside the village. When the convoy entered the predominantly nationalist village moments later, this detainee, along with two other local men, uh, John Gore and John Hill, who were also arrested, and the three of them were shot dead in an alleyway in the centre of the village. Incidentally, a plaque uh, remains in place, uh, the exact spot where they were shot uh, uh, today. An arms search in neighbouring houses proved to be fruitless. And these shootings proposed, uh, provoked a furious response at Westminster, where Joe Devlin called them willful murder. And the judicial inquiry established by David Lloyd George concluded that no one, except for the police and military, even fired at all. James Craig's response to this uh, inquiry, uh, led by Barrington Ward uh, report, was to set up his own Belfast-led investigation. Uh, perhaps it won't surprise you, but the eventual verdict of this uh, contrasted sharply with the findings of the London one. And the Westminster government reluctantly accepted Craig's request to shelve the publication of Barrington Ward's report and also agreed to drop prosecutions against individual officers of, uh, of the uh, USC who had been implicated in the shootings. Obviously, the Catholic minority in County Antrim felt aggrieved over this attack by the specials and uh, resented uh, the lack of... Uh, uh, governmental or judicial uh, support that they saw it. But this was matched by the emotions of the tiny Protestant population in the farmlands outside Alton of Ay, near Newry, uh, after an invasion from the Irish Free State by Frank Aiken's uh, Northern Division. This was during the early hours of the 17th of June, 1922, uh, a week or so before the Cushion Doll attack. Uh, incidentally, Aiken went on uh, despite his involvement in this, perceived involvement in this and the attack on the uh, troop train and other attacks, to become a senior Irish government minister, the deputy Taoiseach, I believe, uh, and also a leading official at the United Nations. Some 30 IRA volunteers left their Dublin base in County Leith and attacked Protestant-owned properties uh, for nearly an hour in these farmlands. In this time, a dozen farmsteads and buildings were torched as residents struggled to find refuge in barns and fields. Six people, including the wife of one of the farmers, it, um, it was believed that she had recognised uh, one of the assailants, and that was the reason why she was uh, shot dead, uh, were uh, shot dead and others were seriously wounded. Unionist reaction to this attack was furious with the Belfast Telegraph declaring that neither sex nor age was spurred in the fury of bloodlust again against this little colony of Protestant families 
who were isolated, defenseless, and easily murdered. And incidentally, um, um, the um, that Protestant uh, minority is still uh, still feels itself um, uh, persecuted today. Uh, the Orange Hall there has been burnt down on several occasions, including one I believe the last one was in twenty seventeen or twenty eighteen. I'd like to come to some conclusions. Uh, the 1920s troubles, uh, which had peaked in their intensity during the uh, six, first six months of 1922, fizzled out that autumn, largely on account of the effect of the special powers legislation, uh, and most notably internment, and the start of the civil war in the rest of Ireland that summer. Yet the legacy of this conflict would not disappear. And I'd like to look at that this briefly. For the North's Catholic minority, the unsympathetic approach of Craig's administration to their plight and their apparent, and the, the, the two bits are equally important, their apparent desertion by their Southern co-religionists would hurt deeply. And this constituted a huge barrier during the new state's early years. The Protestant majority in Northern Ireland, although relieved that peace was restored, would never forget what they perceived uh, to have been the destructive role adopted by the Irish Free State in attacking their frontiers uh, directly in the form of the IRA's um, uh, physical incursions into Northern Territory and indirectly in the form of the economic damage caused by the boycott of Northern goods and banks. And also what they believe to be uh, the... Um, uh, the collusion of certain sections of the North's Catholic community with local IRA divisions. These resulted in the hardening of an already pronounced loyalist siege mentality. Today, as the centenary of many of these events is upon us, we thankfully do not experience political violence on a daily basis in Northern Ireland. However, arguably community divisions remain deep, albeit at the moment mostly under the surface. And we would be ill-advised, I believe, to ignore Northern Ireland's modern history if we desire a better future for our children and grandchildren. Thank you.